buddy, put that thing back in its holster. We haven't gone anywhere. I don't understand. Check out the MichaelDukesShow.com for information on how to get access to the podcast. The Michael Duke Show. I have two guns, one for each of you. Firearms Friday. As Thomas Jefferson stated, it is the right and duty of the people to be at all times armed. To be at all times armed. Say hello to my new friend! I say that the Second Amendment is, in order of importance, the First Amendment. The right to keep and bear arms is the one right that allows rights to exist at all. The right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Not be infringed. Firearms. From my cold, dead hands. Friday. Take my rifle, where is my gun? This is for fighting, it's for fun. Firearms Friday. Fire. On uh, Friday. Hello. And welcome to it. Yes, this, the most beautiful day of the week, TGIFF, it is Firearms Friday, and it is uh, your chance to sound off on issues of a 2A nature right here on the big radio program. Good morning to you. How are you? One, (laughs) one program for all of you. Um, Good morning and welcome uh, to uh, the show. Uh, of course, don't forget, as uh, the uh, as the uh, theme always mentions, you can uh, join us uh, and check us out on the uh, website at michaeldukeshow.com, where you'll find links to the uh, to the uh, audio only live stream, to the social media segments where you can listen to the simulcast on the show, and um, and uh, of course, links to our podcast, which is available everywhere, including Spotify, which is my favorite uh, place to listen to podcasts. Uh, but that's all uh, that's all good stuff, and uh, you can find it there. And of course, just like usual, in plain old regular boring terrestrial radio. I mean, it may be, you know, it's 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 so good. Terrestrial radio is so good, and it's free. I mean, what more could you ask for? Uh, this is some good stuff here. So Friday is the one day a week that we decide to uh, set aside and dedicate to um, our one of my favorite topics. We try and hold all the stories throughout the week uh, that relate to firearms and the Second Amendment. We try and hold them all for Friday because, well, <clears throat> let's face it, it's a good way to end the week. And uh, overall, um, it's... It's just fun. It makes it makes Fridays fun. Let's put it that way. Um, I thought we were going to be lacking in guests today, but no, no, no. Today we are uh, full. Uh, we're full up on guests today. Uh, in just a uh, just a few minutes, about 12, uh, 13 minutes or so, we're going to be picking up uh, our conversations on firearms with Jeff Knox, who is uh, the director of of the Firearms Coalition. Uh, He is, uh, which of course is the um, organization that is, uh, that was founded by his father, Neil Knox in 1984. Uh, They call themselves the conscience of the gun rights movement. Uh, And uh, uh, Jeff does a bunch of different things, including rights uh, for ammo land. And he's got a uh, article uh, that came out here about, hmm, I guess a week ago, almost a week ago that <clears throat> talked about, um, gun-free zones and the shooting that took place, uh, back in November at Walmart as an example of what we're talking about. And this is the same topic that we've covered uh, previously with other folks, including, um, Dr. John Lott, who basically, uh, you know, have pointed out kind of the, the the fallacy or the false sense of security that the idea of a gun free zone brokers and um, and we're going to get into that with Jeff Knox here and it's been a while since we've talked to Jeff it's been gosh I guess it's been a couple of years since we've talked to Jeff so I wanted to bring him back on 
and talk with him about that, and we'll see what uh, we'll see what he has to say. Then, in hour two, one of my favorite writers over at Reason Magazine is going to be uh, touching base with us, and he's going to be on with us right at the top of hour two because we got Willie Waffle at the end of the show, right? So it's a full, like I said, it's a full show. Uh, Chris Chang wasn't able to make it, so I reached out to my buddy JD Two Chili at Reason and said, "Hey, you wrote this awesome article the other day." Um, about the uh, semi-automatic weapons ban that President Biden is going on and on and on about, right? <clears throat> I mean, you re- <laughs> you remember this, right? This is what we covered last week. Um, <laughs> this is the uh, this is the the new push for the lame duck president, where all he wants to do is um, all he wants to do is come in. And uh, ban, um, he wants to ban all semi-automatics. That's what he said, which uh, again, um, JD will get into some of the stats and statistics and figures on this, but that's a huge portion of, uh, of guns in America. I mean, that is, a, that is a huge, huge portion of guns in America. And um, I think it's going to be, um, well, I think it's, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be problematic. Uh, for those of you who weren't here last week and, uh, missed the commentary, this was Joe Biden's commentary about, um, semi-automatic weapons that took place, uh, about, <clears throat> let's see, about, uh, two and a half, three weeks ago during Thanksgiving. Uh, this was Joe Biden's uh, on, uh, 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 this is Joe Biden's comments on on guns and firearms and semi-automatic guns specifically. That not a solid, sick, sick, not a single solitary rationale for having semi-automatic firearms in the public hands, except for the uh, enrichment of the gun manufacturers. That's essentially it. Um, <clears throat> and so this is what he's been doing. These are his talking points. And the gal asked him, is there anything you could do? And he says, we're going to be working on executive orders and we're going to do this. and We're going to push that. And we're going to, I mean, this is where he's going. Anyway, J.D. Chuchilli. Uh, basically says, dream on, and then lists a complete and uh, and a comprehensive reason as to why a semi-automatic weapons ban is probably doomed and destined to failure. And so we'll talk about that in hour two with JD to Chile uh, this morning. So it's it's all it's all good. And then there has been, uh, and then Willie Waffle. We'll finish up with Willie Waffle. Sorry. Uh, oh, I totally forgot. Totally forgot. Um, this morning's program is brought to you uh, by your friends over there at <clears throat> Satellite West. You can find them at satellitewest.com uh, for all your uh, for all your communications needs in the state of Alaska, especially when you're remote. They've got a satellite uh, solution for that, whether it's text messaging uh, or sending an email or making a phone call or surfing the Internet. They've got it all. And they're proud sponsors of the show. And they're proud sponsors of the five days of Christmas, which is now up and running and open for submissions starting a week from yesterday. So next Thursday. We are going to be giving away on the program one bivy stick a day for five days, for the weekdays. So Thursday and Friday of next week, and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of the following week, we're going to be giving away a free bivy stick every day uh, for five days. And the only way you're going to win is by signing up at my website, michaeldukeshow.com, 
And I saw I had a, I had a dozen or so submissions yesterday afternoon after we got it all up yesterday morning. Um, but I'm hoping that we have a couple, three, 400, 500 people sign up here in the next uh, few days. If you'd like to have a baby stick, which is this, I keep forgetting, it's in my coat pocket so that I don't forget it when I leave the house. The baby stick is this little device that connects to your cell phone and turns your cell phone into a satellite communication device. And uh, it basically connects you with the Iridium satellite network, no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing. And with the baby stick, you can send text messages, you can send emails, and you can connect to, uh, you know, map and drop your locations. Uh, you can use group track where a bunch of you gather together if you're out hunting or snow machining or fishing or doing whatever. And you could look and see where all your party members are on the map. Uh, it's got a, just a, a bunch of different cool uses. And uh, anyway, we're giving them away for free, but the only way you can win is by getting signed up. And uh, I might give away one or two to like the best caller of the day or something like that. But for the most part, the only way you're going to win is you got to go get signed up. MichaelDukeShow.com. There's a pivot. There's a uh, Satellite West logo up at the top of the page. The, the first thing on the page underneath the header is, is the big giveaway, the five days of Christmas. And you got to sign up to win. That's all you got to do. Sign up to win. Go. Off with you. I'm giving stuff away. Why don't you sign up for it? Make it happen. Okay. <clears throat> and finally, the uh, strangest thing that I've seen in quite a while. Um, there is a group of bipartisan political bedfellows in Capitol Hill who are working overtime to get a truly, truly weird and bizarre bill to Joe Biden's desk before the current session of Congress expires. The legislation, according to uh, Cam Edwards over at Bearing Arms, would let people prohibit themselves from purchasing or possessing firearms. It was approved on party lines by the House Judiciary Committee, though it's attached to, uh, so, though it's uh, attracted the support of a handful of Republicans. Um, the but the, the, there's some questions as to how the bill might conflict with the existing language of the Gun Control Act of 1968. But that's far from the only objection that has been raised by opponents of the bill. Jim Jordan, the Judiciary Committee ranking member from Ohio, said, do we really need a federal statute to, to permit a person to volunteer to give up their fundamental liberty? That's what this bill does. Mental health is important. We all understand that, especially when it relates to suicide. But this, I mean, really? This is what we're going for? I think this, again, is just another attack from the Democrats on the Second Amendment. Representative Thomas Massey from Kentucky added that he is also worried that the bill might turn people into criminals if they give a firearm as a gift to someone who's on the list. During the committee debate, Democrats said that's not the intent of the law and indicated an openness to fixing it later. But Republicans said the uncertainty of the issue is another reason not to support it. But this this. This whole, I mean, why would you, I mean, why would you want to voluntarily give away your rights? Why would you want to voluntarily, I mean, maybe if you, I don't know. I, I don't, I just don't know. This really seems like, uh, it is one of the most bizarre things that I've ever seen. Uh, I mean, obviously Mental health is a big issue in this country, and especially when it comes to firearms, it becomes a big deal and a big issue because most of the times when they report firearms or gun violence, uh, two-thirds of those numbers, when you're talking about deaths, are actually suicides that they've conflated in the in the argument. I posted a uh, I posted an article from the, <clears throat> the Substack of Hand Waving Freak Outery the other day that goes detail by detail into the causation and correlation between handguns and firearms ownership and <clears throat> gun violence. And he points that out, I mean, in a way that I never could about how they continually sneak in the suicides and uh, and continue to bludgeon gun owners with the suicide deaths of people. Uh, but it's a serious issue and it should be addressed separately outside of the, 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 uh, the uh, issue about firearms and stuff. But this bill is just, I mean, it's just, it's weird. It's weird, man. Feels bad, man. We'll continue our discussions on that later on. Right now, we got to go to break because Jeff Knox from the Firearms Coalition is going. 
man, he looks Christmassy. I can see him in the green room. He's got a big Christmas tree behind him and everything. I feel like a piker here in this quiet little room. All right, we're going to uh, continue with this here in just a moment. Don't go anywhere. The Michael Duke Show, Common Sense, Liberty-based, free-thinking radio. We're back with more and Jeff Knox right after this. We're broadcasting live through a series of tubes. Allowing all of these entities to provide streaming stuff going on on the the, the internet. Well, it's kind of hard to explain. Sorry. Streaming live every weekday morning on Facebook Live and MichaelDukesShow.com. All right, we're in the break right now. Commercial breaks running across the state. Meanwhile, it's just uh, me and you and uh, and who else? Cindy, you, who, who, Hill? No, no, no. It's Jim from the Firearms Policy, the Firearms School. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, uh. He's joining to uh, talk, talk a little bit about everything. Good morning, my friend. How uh, how morning, how is Michael. you doing? I'm good. I'm good. How you, are you doing? Uh, Merry Christmas. You know. Merry Christmas to you, my friend. It, um, I mean, you are, you are, I got to back out here a little bit because you look at that. I mean, you are in the spirit, my <laughs> friend, a heck of a backdrop. Look at, I mean, I just got boring foam covered walls and you're like, I am Mr. Christmas today. That's what you're if doing. Is it too busy, too bright? I can turn around and face the other oh, wall. No, it's, it's pretty not. too. Absolutely. No, no, absolutely not. I love it. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm excited to see it. You know, we were talking about this the other day, Jeff, you know, there are certain, I always love Christmas, but you know, sometimes you just feel it, right? Sometimes Christmas is just, <laughs> man, you feel it. Sometimes it's just kind of like, oh yeah, it's Christmas and I'm okay. And, and then some years you're like constantly wiping, wiping a little tear from your eye about how much spirit you have and everything else. I'm trying to get into that mode. I want to have a tear in my eye. <laughs> I want to feel good about this. So this is helping. So this is helping. Um, uh, I will say this is a great article from Ammo Land. I'm going to drop this. Uh, I'm going to drop this link in the chat room here, and, uh, um, and for folks to uh, for folks to go take a, a listen to or take a read from it. Um, it's interesting because you know we've covered this topic um, uh, with uh, people like Doc and others. Uh, I think it it continually bears repeating. Uh, that this idea that somehow some placard that says, please don't do that, is not going to stop bad people from doing bad things. And uh, I think you make some good, uh, I think you make some great points on this. So I'm, I'm glad to, uh, I'm glad to see that that is, uh, is it, we're going to get a chance to talk about that and everything else. Okay. Um, I think we'll start off, uh, if you don't mind, just uh, here, what are we, we're two minutes and 30 seconds returning to the radio. Um, I think we'll start off, uh, if you don't mind, with just a little bit of a history of the Firearms Coalition. And, uh, you know, so people know, because I think may, there may be people out there that have never heard of it. They don't know. They don't know. Or maybe they think it's FPC and they're not quite sure what's going on. So, you right. know, I, I'd love to love to start with that. So, yep. but how how you been? Clarification. Yeah. Um, ups and downs. We're, we're, um, we actually lost our oldest son this time last year. And so that yeah. makes uh, makes the holidays a little um, challenging at times. Yeah. And I just found out that my dog is dying. So <laughs> Merry Christmas, buddy. <laughs> Jeez, man. It's like a country western song. This is not yeah, a yeah. You, yeah. You I, uh, oh. I, I put my uh, I put my dog down here about a year ago um, and. Um, um, oh, oh, poor guy. He's- What's up, bud? What? <laughs> what? Yeah, uh, I I had to put my dog down here just about it, just just a hair over a year ago, and uh, I'd had him for thirteen years, and that's a it's a hard it's a hard thing to do. I mean, I'm tough as nails and twice as smart, but I, even I cried a little bit when that happened. That's a that's a you know. Yeah. Yep. It's it's. Uh, I mean, life life throws challenges, but um, yeah. you know. All in all, God is good. I live in a beautiful place with a beautiful woman with uh, everything that I could ever hope for. So, yeah, that's all you can. All you can can do is count your blessings, right? That's what you got to do. Count your blessings. 
Um, all right, Jeff. Uh, well, we're getting ready to uh, come back into it. I'm going to mute you here for just a second. Uh, so uh, don't uh, don't uh, don't panic. I'm going to mute you, and then we will be back to you here in just one second, folks. If you do me a favor. If you would like and uh, follow the show page, and if you would go over to YouTube, and if you would ring the bell and subscribe and do all the youtube things, and you can even go over to Twitch TV and do stuff over there as well, because, I don't know, why not? That Twitch generation, uh, they pop into the page every now and then when I'm live, and they ask crazy questions like, ooh, Santa Claus, what are you doing? Uh, they just, they, you know, I freak out all the kids over on Twitch. But it's another option just in case something else goes down. And that, my friends, means it's time to jump back into it. Here we go. Common sense, liberty-based, free-thinking radio, The Michael Duke Show. Uh, do all the things. Let's get to it. And here we go. Welcome back to the program. It is Firearms Friday. Your chance to sound off on issues of 2A Nature. Our guest this morning is Jeff Knox, who is the director of the Firearms Coalition. Uh, Jeff and I met, oh man, it's been, I guess it's been almost a dozen years ago, maybe more, uh, down at, I think SHOT Show is where we first got a chance to meet face-to-face, and I've had him on the program several times, but it's been two or three years since he's uh, been on the show uh, to talk about things, but he has written this amazing article uh, over at Ammo Land. The title of the article is, wait, he's not allowed to have a gun in Walmart, Uh, and it's an opinion piece that talks specifically about what we have hit on time and time and time again, which is gun-free zones are really nothing more than target rich environments. Uh, so he joins us to discuss this. And of course, uh, first things first, uh, good morning, Jeff. Thanks for coming on the program. Um, welcome and uh, Merry Christmas to you. Good morning, Michael. Merry Christmas. Uh, I want folks now people hear hear you. They may, you know, recognize the name. Uh, they know, you know, they, they may have heard it from time to time, uh, but the Firearms Coalition, can you tell folks, now this has been around, this was started by your dad uh, back in what, 84, right? And so, right, 1984. Right. So can you tell us a little bit about what the Firearms Coalition does and what it's about and, and what you guys do? Well, the most important thing that we, we do, and this has been our mission from the beginning, is get good, solid, actionable information and analysis out to the average gun voter and um, keep that information flowing. Um, They used to refer to dad as the conscience of the gun rights movement. Um, He he had a reputation for uh, being a hardliner, but uh, also for being a really straight shooter. And I've uh, in the, what has it been? 16 years, uh, 17 years since since I took over the coalition, uh, I, I've tried to maintain that that aspect that that uh, while we do some lobbying, we work with other organizations around the country, grassroots organizations around the country. We help with uh, strategic planning for those organizations. Um, we do all of those things. But the main thing that we've ever done is provide good information and give people some good talking points and something to think about. Um, because that's that's what it's all about. Uh, not just thinking about it, but being able to express it in ways that make sense. Uh, I, I never fail. It never fails to amaze me how bad the Republican Party is at getting a message out Um, (laughs) they don't seem to be interested in in educating their their public and so they allow democrats to lie about particularly gun issues and then they just say hey we're good guys you should vote for us Um, and uh, for some reason gee a lot of the people in the middle don't and uh, we just saw that, and and it's just astounding how the the guys that are on our side seem to have 
an amazing ability to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory time and time again. Yeah, no, it's frustrating. And I know that, uh, uh, you know, I know it's been hard. Um, and you must have guys have must have had a lot of work lately. I know that uh, this whole meltdown with the NRA and all this other stuff in New York, I mean, that's caused a lot of, you know, new groups to pop up because people are they're finally they're washing their hands and they're like, they're done. This is old news to you guys, because you guys have known about and talked about some of the corruption and bad stuff that's happened in there and LaPierre, et cetera, for years. Right. I mean, this is like oh, you absolutely. guys, you must, feel, you must feel vindicated by some of this stuff at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. You know, dad, dad, uh, was a gun writer. Um, editor, publisher of, of rifle and handloader magazines, worked for a, a variety of different magazines over the years. But he was one of the most respected gun writers in the country. And he dropped all of that to go to D.C. to be the executive director of NRA ILA back in 1978. This was after he helped to spearhead the, the uh, Cincinnati revolt in 1977. But he got in there and he he had a legislative agenda. And the main legislative agenda was to fix the worst parts of the Gun Control Act of 1968. Um, And they eventually watered that down and and passed it in 1986 with the Hughes Amendment attached to it as the Firearms Owners Protection Act or FOPA. Um, And it was (laughs) (laughs) to a degree. and there was a lot of good stuff in it, uh, but uh, but at any rate, Dad Dad went on to uh, eventually be on the board of directors of the NRA and uh, was in line to be the president. He was the the first vice president, ready to take over as the president the next year after Marion Hammer, and he and Wayne got into an argument about money. Uh, Dad didn't like the way Wayne was raising it or the way Wayne was spending it. And he and a majority of the board were insisting that Wayne reel things in, get rid of some of the bad actors, and uh, fly straight, uh, treat our members, the NRA members, with more respect. And um, Dad lost. They brought in Charlton Heston, and and we lost that fight. Uh, Wayne solidified his position at the top uh, as executive vice president and CEO. And it went downhill from there. Salaries went, Wayne's salary went from 200, 250,000 a year to 800,000 a year in just a few years from, from the time they got dad out of the chairs. And right. uh, it's just, it's just gone downhill from there. He's currently, I think at one and a quarter million uh, a year while membership is crashing uh, and fundraising is crashing and, all of their programs are cut back to the bone. It's just, it's, it's a travesty and it's a shame. And the fix for this would have been two years ago for the NRA board of directors to say, Wayne, we're not saying that you did anything wrong. We're not making any accusations, but you're a liability at this point rather than right. a, an asset. And you need to step aside. Right. Perception uh, is reality at that point. They had the opportunity. They could have just asked him to resign with no harm, no foul. Given and, him his golden parachute and yep. and let him continue in the background as a as a helper and fundraiser and a hero of the Second Amendment. But instead, as I wrote two years ago, they had two choices. They could either do that, ask Wayne to step down and, and quietly move forward, or they could circle the wagons around Wayne and keep circling right down the drain. And uh, they chose the second option. And over the last two and a half years, we have watched that circling motion as they're, they're heading down the drain. And it is, it's utterly shameful right. what's been going on. And, uh, and so sad. Yeah. Because I, there's no dog in this fight for me. Uh, there's some personal vindication and some personal, you know, animus between myself and and Wayne over the way he treated my father after he died uh, back several years ago. I I didn't think it was right. I was was unhappy with that, but that that's not why I pursue him or pursue reform in the NRA. It's because I've been a life member of the NRA for over 40 years, 
I right. care about the organization and I want to see it successful. It is our big dog on the block. And none of these other organizations can come close to touching what the NRA does. The, the biggest organization outside of NRA is going to raise something like $20 million a year. NRA was at almost $400 million a year enterprise. And that's, that's just staggering. Right. But these guys were shoveling a bunch of that money into their pockets in the process and they got caught with their hands in the cookie jar and uh it's costing us all it's it's in my mind the lawsuit's going to finally come to trial next year probably not until summer of next year at the earliest and i fully expect nra to lose and after they lose and it it's already costing them I believe that we're going to pay Bill Brewer, their attorney, over $60 million just this year. Right. Um, while we're losing money hand over fist, while we're losing members. But um, I believe that as soon as that lawsuit hits, as, as soon as the trial hits, the judge will find them, them culpable. Uh, there will be a whole lot of fines that will have to be paid by LaPierre and some others to to try and repay some of what's been lost and it's very likely that they'll put um a someone in charge you know that they'll put in a temporary uh overseer for the association and we're already on the verge of bankruptcy i think that having someone appointed by a new york judge unless unless they pick somebody really prominent and trusted by gun owners um I think that that uh, the NRA members aren't going to support them. They're going to be afraid to send money to to that failing organization. And then I think Letitia James, the Attorney General of New York, is going to turn around and sue individual members of the board of directors and the officers, and and possibly the entire board. And those guys are going to have to pay that out of their pocket because there won't be anything at NRA to pay for those those legal expenses and right. they're going to find out the consequences of not taking action when they needed to take action because they have a a legal fiduciary responsibility and obligation and they haven't been fulfilling it and it is it's just it's utterly a shame michael it's it's a it shame. is it's a it's it's horrible and just for clarification for listeners out there we're talking with jeff knox by the way from the firearms coalition uh, you know, we're look, we're not trying to run down the the NRAs, like especially the local and the state affiliates and the programs and all the volunteers. Those people are golden. My my heartburn has always been with the NRA at the national level, LaPierre, uh, Cox, ILA, the board for not doing this kind of stuff, because this is what it's opened us up to. It's opened us up to this kind of scrutiny, the potential for actually even losing the charter in the state of New York. I mean, it's a it's a horrific deal. But um, we got a little sidetracked there, but it's good. I wanted to know what the firearms policy or the firearms coalition is doing and what, um, you know, and kind of, uh, you know, a little bit of the history there for folks to uh, to know about what's going on. Um, all right. Well, Jeff, I want to talk about this uh, article, but we're up against the break. So we'll take the break. And then when we come back, we will uh, dive into this article, which you can find over at Ammo Land. The title of the article, wait, he's not allowed to have a gun in Walmart. I know, I know, he's not supposed to. But uh, what does that piece of paper say on the wall? What is that doing to protect you? We're going to talk about that in Gun Free Zones and more uh, when we return with Jeff Knox from the Firearm Coalition. We'll be back with more right after this. Don't go anywhere. Our light, our guide, and our trusted friend. Michael, 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 Michael. Okay, in the break uh, with uh, Jeff Knox from the uh, Firearms Coalition. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I watched this thing just melt down in New York, uh, Jeff, and I was just shaking my head like, I mean, how how could the board? I mean, do they not understand that they're opening themselves up to personal liability by refusing right. to take action, by choosing what I guess they saw as the easy road of not rocking the boat? They have opened themselves up to potential liability personally because they failed to exercise their fiduciary responsibility. I'm not a smart man. I mean, I, but even I understand that, right? That yep. if you're, you're on the board, uh, you're supposed to be, you're supposed to be uh, managing and executing millions and millions of dollars worth of stuff, but you just pass it all over to Wayne. And then when the, when the, the light turns on and the cockroaches start to scurry, you just go, oh, well, he'll handle it. No big deal. And of course, the ones, the ones that lose is the gun owners. Well, and the, it, it's really one of the things that's just so disappointing is that the NRA board of directors are a group of just incredibly talented and accomplished people. It's it's a huge board of directors. It's way too big, bigger than it should be. It's 76 members, but they are by and large, really good people, really accomplished people. Uh, there's been some decline over the last several years as Wayne's been running out of, of people who would support him um, and, and serve on the board. But, um, but by and large, the NRA board of directors for, has always been full of really impressive people. And for these really impressive people to be um, making such a huge mistake and to double down and triple down on that massive mistake is just, it's, it's astounding. It's, it's just astounding. Um, but I was writing about this, you know, as, as I say, when I wrote that they had the two choices, right. The response from members of the NRA board of directors was, Oh, that's just Jeff Knox dr grinding his daddy's axe. Uh, he's still mad because his daddy lost to Wayne 20 some years ago. And it's like, no, people read. It doesn't matter whether it's me that's saying it or a reporter for Bloomberg that's that's digging up the trash. What Bloomberg did was they they hired a really good investigative reporter named Michael Spies. And they said, go dig up dirt on the NRA. There's lots of rumors circulating around. Look into those, dig up some dirt, see what you can find. And he went and he found a whole bunch of dirt and he published it in the New Yorker. And uh, so far as I can recall, just off the top of my head, I don't think there's a single thing, a single accusation that Spies made in that original New Yorker article that hasn't proven to be true and hasn't been admitted to by LaPierre and company. But right. he's, he's kept changing his story to, to make excuses. But, but um, in, the, in the totality, he's come out and said, oh yeah, yeah, I did do that. I, I did spend millions and millions of dollars on private air travel for my wife and my niece and uh, NRA reimbursed all of that, pay, covered all of that. And no, it wasn't NRA business, but, but, but I, I'm paying all of that back. I paid all of that back. Well, more $500,000 in suits and clothes and all this kind of stuff. And I'm just like, fifty. Yeah. 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 Like what happened? You're getting paid one point, whatever million dollars a year. And you got to have the NRA members pay for your suits. Do. Well, and, and, and this is one of the things, one of the board of directors came up to me at the last members meeting and he, he said, you know, well, we're seeing that a lot of this, you know, you know the suits, they, that's, that's been cleared that that was just uh, a non-issue, you know, that, that actually Ackerman McQueen, the PR firm had paid for that and, and didn't bill it back to the NRA. Well, no, Don, just because Ackerman and McQueen has stepped back from using it as an accusation against Wayne and are now claiming that, oh, we ate that cost, doesn't mean that they did. It means that, they're, they, that they realized that 
if they actually said that they had billed that to the NRA, it was increasing their own liability and culpability. This is a bunch of crooks in a circle and they're covering their butts. And that's what Ackerman yeah. and McQueen did. And for someone as intelligent as that particular director to not see that, I just, I don't understand it. I, I cannot yeah. begin to understand. Uh, it's, I think it's a, what is it? What is it they refer to sunk cost? that that you've got too much invested into it to right. to, to let it go out. now you know yeah. that you keep pouring money into the boat or into the the house or into the car that that just is eating your money and um and there's also just a a, a whole lot of misplaced loyalty uh, a lot of these people have forgotten or think that loyalty yeah. to Wayne oh. is the same thing as loyalty to the NRA hold hold on Jeff here we go the Michael Duke show Continuing now with Jeff Knox from the Firearms Coalition. We're talking about his new article, uh, his opinion piece. It was up in Amoland just under a week ago uh, entitled, Wait, He's Not Allowed to Have a Gun in Walmart. And Jeff, you kind of use this as, a, as an example of what we've been talking about in, gun, in the gun culture for many, many years. This idea that, uh, you know, first they want to disarm everybody. Uh, and, and then they want to create in New York after Bruin. Of course, we've seen all these sensitive areas and everything else. And of course, before that, we had posted signs in various locations and places that said this is a gun free zone. And uh, as I've said for many years, you know, a gun free zone is really translates for bad people, for criminals, for evildoers into a target rich environment because they know for the most part that the average person is law abiding. Uh, is legal and law-abiding, will follow the rules. And so when they see a sign that says no guns allowed, they go, oh, okay. But bad guys and criminals, by their very definition, don't care about the law. And so they just walk in past that piece of paper and go, game on. Um, and you've written about this in uh, in this recent shooting that happened uh, just before Thanksgiving in Walmart. Give us a, give us a rundown here. Well, uh, there's a a site, I don't know if you're familiar with it, it's called Quora. And it's just a place where people post questions and other people post answers. And I've been following a lot of Quora stuff for years uh, because I'm something of a know-it-all and, <laughs> and I like to show it. Um, but actually my brother uh, suggested it and we, we look at that and, and someone had asked, uh, you know, can you carry a gun and a conce can you carry a concealed handgun in, in Walmart? Um, can an employee carry a concealed handgun in Walmart? And I, I answered, well, yes, uh, a person can carry a concealed handgun almost anywhere as long as they don't have, you know, extreme security measures like metal detectors and pat downs. Um, is it legal? Is it against company policy? You know, uh, that that depends. And it turns out that Walmart's company policy is that employees in their home store are not supposed to carry typically um, unless uh, there's some exceptions for certain managers in stores that sell guns. Do they realize that, it, that, that if they sell guns that maybe somebody who has a gun might, I don't know, it's just stupidity, but you might as well make a big sign and put it in the middle of Kiev and say, you know, this is a gun-free zone and that will end the war with Russia. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's the way real life reality works is you put up a sign and everything is fine from there forward. We all know that that's idiocy, but we keep doing it. And what it really comes down to is that like almost all gun laws, it might seem reasonable. It might seem to make sense, right? It the surface level, but the moment that you lift up that first layer, you see that, wait, this doesn't make any sense at all. Um, some 90% of mass shootings, uh, mass murders have occurred in gun-free zones in the last 20 years. Um, it 
it doesn't work. Signs on the wall that say no guns allowed. Well, that means that there that that my gun might not come in there, whether it's that I I choose not to do business with that that particular establishment because of that no gun sign, which happens a whole lot, and owners of businesses need to understand that. But or I leave it in the truck. Um and gee, guess what? If you've got an NRA sticker on your truck and your truck is parked in front of the county courthouse, um, it's a target. It's yeah. a target. You've created and, a whole new level of liability at that point. Right. Because yeah. You know? I, I've often said if I was a, if I was a <clears throat> excuse me, if I was a criminal looking for a handgun, all I had to do was go to a place you know, a bank, a courthouse, or any place where it's very, very illegal to have a firearm. And I just look at the vehicles until I found one that had a veteran sticker on it or a, or a gun organization sticker or something like that. If that's what you do, I mean, that that's pretty easy pickings at that point. Uh, but you make, a, you make an interesting point on, uh, on this. Now, first of all, I, you know, you talked about 90 plus percent of the shootings happening in gun-free zones. And yeah, Dr. Lott, actually, Dr. John Lott uh, talked about that several of the more prominent shooters actually in their manifestos and in their journals and in their papers that were recovered after the fact, they write specifically in their plans about why they're going to place X, Y, or Z. And many of them mention, well, they want to go to these places because they're gun-free zones and they'll have a chance to kill more people before they themselves get killed. Um, right. And we saw the opposite of that in this Greenville Mall shooting that happened recently, where again, it was a gun-free zone, but one of the one of the uh, patrons ignored the ignored the paper sign on the wall and was able to stop that shooter. And you notice how the owner of the mall thanked him profusely, didn't pay, didn't didn't trespass him, didn't scold him for breaking their rules. They thanked him for stopping the shooter. I, this right. stuff is insane. And well, we saw it years ago in Pearl, Mississippi, when uh, the the assistant principal heard shooting ran out to his car, pulled a, a gun out of his glove box and uh, challenged the bad guy as he was trying to leave campus heading to the junior high where he was planning to extend his shooting spree. Um, and, uh, you know, he was able to take him into custody. We didn't see them prosecuting that principle for... Um, violating the gun-free zone, the gun-free schools right. act. Right. Um, so, you know, it's, it's one of those matters of convenience, but the, the Batman shooter, the guy who attacked the movie theater where they were showing a Batman movie, uh, he passed several other theaters uh, on his way to that theater um, that didn't have prominently placed gun-free zone signs. And uh, and he went to the one that had the prominent gun free zone signs posted. Uh, speaking of John Lott, he's under attack now. Actually, it's the same uh, investigative reporter who broke the story on NRA. I'm very disappointed with him in this in his article on John Lott because he's going around. He went around to gun violence researchers um, shills for the the gun control industry and got them on the record saying that that John Lott you know does sneaky things and twists statistics and so forth when John is most famous for untwisting the right. statistics of of these uh shill researchers and um it's what they're attempting to do is cancel John Lott they're attempting to keep him out of the pages of the mainstream media with his research and his um, uh, counterbalance to these bogus researchers. And um, so I, I would encourage all of your listeners, your local media, your big media that you subscribe to, um, write to them, call them, send them a note and tell them that uh, you respect John Lott and his research and you want to keep seeing him in the pages of their uh, of their media because um, this is a, a, a real straight up attempt to attack John Lott and to cancel him. Uh, I should have an article on this coming out in, in the very near future, but it's, it's really atrocious. But um, 
yeah, let's get back to the article here because right. you make a key point, which I think is important. Um, and uh, you, you write that the key thing that these gun control extremists, including politician and media pundits, can't seem to grasp is that guns don't cause crime or violent actions. And we've talked about that for a long time, you know. Oh, Johnny was such a nice and tish boy, and then and then somebody gave him a gun, and Johnny became a monster and was possessed by a demon. And, you know, no, Johnny was always a thug. And, you know, it just happens that now he had a gun and he felt empowered to go out and do that thing. It wasn't the gun. It was Johnny. You know, it's the people. The gun is an inanimate object. It's a tool like any other. But they have anthropomorphized the firearm and vilified it to the point to where we would be, live in a perfect society if guns had never been invented. Right, right. And it, it, it really is. It's, it's magical thinking. Um, and one of the things, one of the key things, and I, I bring it up in the article, uh, is that there are odd people out there. As a matter of fact, most of us are kind of odd. <laughs> and, and my wife comments that, that I frequently use the term, well, he's a bit of an odd duck. And she'll giggle and she'll look at me and say, yeah, so are you, honey. And, <laughs> and it's absolutely true. You know, we're all a little bit off, a little bit strange, a little bit different from the other guy. And um, we all know people have known people through our lives that are like, well, I'm not sure if I really would trust that guy with a gun. And guess what? We trust that guy with a gun and we do it by the millions across the country. And by the millions, they don't betray that trust. Um, as far as the, you know, most mass murders are, are either uh, gang related, drug related, uh, you know, deals gone bad, whatever. Um, or, you know, scumbag beefs at a strip club or the Hells Angels uh, meeting house. But then there's the, the crazies. And this is the one that scares the people the most. It's the right. crazy that goes into a school, goes into a, a supermarket and just starts randomly killing people. Well, that's almost always just an elaborate suicide. It's a guy who's too cowardly to to go alone. So he wants to take people with him and get famous in the process. That's one of the reasons I never use <laughs> these murderers names. But, yeah, me either. Um, but these, uh, we all know people that are a little bit off, but we know very few people that go over the edge. And that's the point. Um, let's punish all of the people for these, these little few that might go over the edge. They're not, right. they're, they're not psychic. They can't control all of this. Jeff Knox uh, has been our guest, the Firearms Coalition. You can read his article up on Ammo Land. I've got it up uh, linked in the chat room. You can't legislate insanity or evil, Jeff. That's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate you coming on board. Thanks for uh, joining us today. Hold the line. Folks, Thanks, we are uh, out of time for this hour. The Michael Duke Show continues. JD to Chili from Reason Magazine up next. Jeff, I mean, I, I you know, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, again, you can't legislate evil or insanity. We try. We try to do our best. But the bottom line is you just you can't you just can't legislate it because people are going to snap. Sometimes people are going to go you crazy. Can't, you can't anticipate it. You never know when it's going to happen or who it's going to happen. Yep. And thankfully, it only happens to a very, very small few. Um, but they catch a lot of press and and it's a yep. it's a shame. That's, I mean, that's one thing we didn't get into, but it's the media, you know, the mainstream media, the clickbait 24 seven media that has fostered this. I had a friend, <clears throat> one of my, my best friend, he had a friend that lives in Barcelona, Spain, and he had invited her to come to the States to watch, I think WrestleMania or something. And her father talked her out of it because he said, you know, America guns in the street everywhere, people dying every day. It's a, it's like Beirut, you know, mm -hmm. because that's what the mainstream media portrays. When in all reality, we're at one of the lowest, I and mean, we've had a little bit of an increase over the last couple of years, but we're at the lowest ebb cycle in gun violence, gun crime, and murder that we've had over like 30 or 40 years. Yep. But the yep. way the news media portrays it, we're all going to die tomorrow. Don't walk outside your house, you know?
Yeah. And even our, our own guys, we, we feed that, that narrative, uh, our side, you know, to help stoke up the, you need a gun for self-defense. Uh, uh, we, we talk about the crime and, and, you know, home invasion stories and the good guy with a gun that saved people and, and all of that's important and good. But at the same time, the reality is that most of us are just like me. I've been carrying a gun for 40 years, um, fairly religiously, you know, almost everywhere when, when that's a possibility. And, um, I have never drawn it in anger. I've, I've been a little concerned a few times and, and, uh, but I don't think I've ever put my hand on my gun in fear or, or anger or concern right. in over 40 years. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, most of us, that's our life. We're not drug dealers in an inner city neighborhood or associated with drug dealers in an inner city neighborhood. And so the odds of us becoming involved in a, a shooting incident are extremely low. But at the same time, uh, both of my sons have had shooting incidents in their schools when they were growing up. Um, and uh, that's alarming, that's concerning. Um, but, um, you know, what are you going to do about it? Guess what? It's, it's, it's not easy. It's not simple. It's not straightforward. And right. these, these silly rules they come up with don't help. They just well, don't. It's like the politicians. Well, if we just passed one more law, there's 22,000 regulations on the books about firearms, right? Mm -hmm. But if we just passed one more law, boy, that would solve it. I guarantee it. I mean, these criminals, wait, they're criminals. Yes, I know. Well, that means they don't follow the law. Well, yeah, but if I, but this one law will fix it. I mean, you know, it's the same thing over and over. Right. All right. Uh, Jeff Knox, uh, the Firearms Coalition. Uh, we got to do this more often. I mean, can, we oh, can't wait. Yeah. We can't wait two years, three years to sit down and talk. So uh, we'll we'll touch base with you after the new year. Maybe we'll get you back on the program here in a couple months, okay? All right, Michael. Appreciate it. Merry Christmas, brother. Merry Christmas. I'll be looking for that article on John Lott. So I appreciate you uh, coming on board. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Thanks for coming in and joining us. Uh, uh, Jeff Knox, the Firearms Coalition, our guest here on the Michael Duke Show. I see waiting in the wings the beautiful smiling face of Mr. J.D. Tuchilli with uh, Reason Magazine. Uh, he joins us this morning uh, to uh, get ready. We're, we're about ready to rejoin for hour two, uh, but he's ready to talk with us about President Biden and his attempt to, oh, it's a sick, sick outlaw, the, uh, you know, in his, uh, in his own way. Good morning, uh, J.D. How are you doing? Doing well. Thanks for having me on. Well, you know, thanks for the last minute save. I mean, I, I, I didn't expect JD to be able to do it after we lost Chris Chang. And he's like, sure. I'm like, wow, I love this guy. He's flexible. He comes on and, and does it. This article is excellent because it points out all the things that, uh, uh, you know, when we saw this and I played the clip earlier of the president actually saying it's sick, sick that you could still buy semi-automatic weapons, obviously having no idea that that count constitutes probably 65 or 70 percent of all firearms in possession right now um you know it, it's it's interesting to watch but you break this down and so i'm looking forward to talking to you about it how's your holiday season been my friend we haven't talked since before thanksgiving made it easy i left my christmas lights up last year i just plugged them in this year streamlined the whole process that is that is easy. I mean, that is easy. I mean, it's great. You know, guys like flick the switch on. You know, what's really awkward is when you accidentally flick the switch on at night sometime in June. You know, and then you're like, oh yeah. no, wait, wrong wrong switch. Right, let me flick the other switch back. But it is uh, festive. Yeah, it is. It is. It's good stuff. I know my son was, I told my son, he's like, I want to, he goes, I want lights on the edge of the house because we don't usually put lights outside the house because we get a lot of snow and stuff. And I'm like, I'm like, if you want to. And he's out there, it's snowing like the Dickens the other day, and he is out there on a ladder putting these hooks on, and he's like, I got half of it done. He's soaking wet from the snow. He's, I got half of it done. Okay, all right. Well, let me know if you need to. I'll come hold the ladder. You go do your thing. Uh, but it's just great to be, uh, it's great to be in, in the mood for the season. Um, all right, J.D., well, um, I'm assuming you don't have any snow there in uh, in Arizona, right? I mean, you're... We definitely don't. We get it on occasion, but not now. No, not for sure. Yeah. We got tw I got 22 inches at the house in the last uh, 36 hours, so it's like uh, 
white Christmas. Somebody needs to stop beating the Christmas uh, uh, drum, you know, and and stop praying for the white Christmas because we're done with it. Uh, all right. Well, I'm going to put you back in the green room for just a hot second. We're about to. Uh, oh man, I got a new monitor. I got a new monitor. Tour and I keep using the mouse. All right, here we go. Uh, I'm going to put you back into the uh, green room for just a second, JD, and we're going to be back to you. Folks, like and share the show, like and follow the show page. Go to YouTube, subscribe, ring the bell, do all the YouTube things. Follow me on Twitch. Let's uh let's get going. Here we go. Hour two, dead ahead. The Michael Duke show, Firearms Friday. Yeah. Buddy, put that thing back in its holster. We haven't gone anywhere. I don't understand. Check out the MichaelDukesShow.com for information on how to get access to the podcast. The Michael Duke Show. I have two guns, one for each of you. Firearms Friday. As Thomas Jefferson stated, it is the right and duty of the people to be at all times armed. To be at all times armed. Say hello to my little friend! I say that the Second Amendment is, in order of importance, the First Amendment. The right to keep and bear arms is the one right that allows rights to exist at all. The Michael Duke Show. The right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Not be infringed. Firearms. From my cold, dead hands. Friday. It's my rifle, it's my gun, this is for fighting, it's for fun. Firearms Friday. Firearms Friday, baby. Your chance to sound on off, uh, sound on off, sound off. Just sound off. Don't sound on and off. That's confusing. Sounding off on issues of a 2A nature right here on the big radio broadcast. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, busy, busy day. We just finished up with Jeff Knox from the Firearms Coalition, and we're about to jump into it with J.D. Tuchilli, editor over at Reason Magazine, uh, on his latest article. And we're going to finish up the show this morning with Willie Waffle. From WaffleMovies.com. Yes, that's his real name, Willie Waffle. He's going to talk to us about the movies, the streams, the entertainment news, and more. It's kind of my lighter side segment for the end of the week to kind of lighten things up. But before we get to all that, I have to mention our friends at Satellite West. Satellite West sponsoring the program again today. It doesn't matter if you're at Adak or Anaktuvik or Nuiqsut or up in Uktavik uh, or, uh, you know, Adak or Kodiak or wherever you are in the state of Alaska. Uh, you could stay connected with your friends at Satellite West. They've got the connectivity to give you text messaging, email, internet surfing, phone calls, whatever. They are proud to provide you with that and access to the Iridium Satellite Network. And they're the sponsors of our Five Days of Christmas promotion. We're starting next Thursday. Every day we're going to give away a bivy stick. What's a bivy stick? It's a little, it's a little uh, pack of card sized device that connects to your cell phone and turns your cell phone into a satellite communications device. So you can send text messages and emails. You could check your map locations. If your friends have got uh, bivy sticks and you're all traveling together, snow machining, hunting, fishing, whatever, it'll show where everybody is on the map. It's group track. They've got all different kinds of functions and features, and we're giving five of them away. One a day for five days, the five days of Christmas. I'm a genius in marketing. And all you got to do to get signed up is go over to my website at michaeldukeshow.com right now and click on any of the Satellite West. Low, it's right there at the top of the page. You can't miss it. The only way to win is to get signed up, and you got to go do that right now. We're going to give away our first bivy stick next Thursday, and uh, we'll do that right up until my final day of broadcast for the year, which is Wednesday the 21st. Don't forget, that'll be my final day of broadcast. And then I'm on vacation till the new year. <clears throat> I can't wait. All right, let's jump into it now, shall we? And get into the discussions with uh, my friend Jay Chili from uh, Reason Magazine. Uh, he is all the way down there in Arizona, uh, but he has uh, kindly uh, agreed to travel up here to Fairbanks uh, electronically or up to Alaska electronically and uh, give us a little bit of a rundown. Good morning, my friend. How are you doing? Doing well. Thanks for having me. 
Well, I, I appreciate it as always. It's a pleasure to talk with you. You can do some good stuff out there. And uh, I mean, I don't want you to get a big head, but I usually look for your articles first. When I'm on reason. Uh, you know, it's it's good stuff. Uh, I also tell Robbie Sove the same thing. So don't don't worry about that. Uh, anyway, it's uh, it's good to see you. Uh, you wrote this article the other day, which the second I read the article, I was like, oh, I should call J.D., but he's probably busy. And I didn't until I lost my guess yesterday. Um, because I read this article and I like, you know, you're right on. Uh, this is the article in Reason Magazine entitled President Biden wants to ban semi-automatic weapons, question mark. And then it says dream on uh, because there's a lot of reasons why that's probably not going to work. I played the clip earlier this morning. I'm going to play it one more time just so folks can hear. This is the president's own words uh, right after Thanksgiving. Uh, when he was talking about semi-automatic weapons, where he kind of just, you know, he said the, the the silent part out loud and said, this is the real agenda of the Democrats. This is President Biden. So uh, it's sick. It's sick. Just profit for the gun manufacturer. That's all it is. It's, it has nothing to do with protections or enjoyment or hunting or uh, or just, you know, because it's my right, damn it. It doesn't matter any of that stuff. It's just to benefit the gun manufacturers. And it's sick. J.D., break it down for me here, man. I mean, the first thing is we, we're going to have to do a, they got a little bit of uh, give him a little bit of, of uh, slack and assume he knows what he's talking about, which is not always a safe assumption with Joe Biden. But I mean, assuming that he does know what he's talking about and just kind of saying that quiet part out loud, the idea of banning semi-automatic weapons and claiming that they don't have any social redeeming characteristics is ridiculous. Um, he and a lot of the other old school gun controllers seem to live in this, you know, back in the day when he first started advising his wife to fire a shotgun randomly in the sky in order to protect right, herself. Right. Um, the idea that, I mean, it's just about deer rifles, bolt actions, and lever actions is long gone. We're living in the era of what uh, David Yamini uh, calls gun culture 2.0, when the predominant uh, driving factor for Americans to own firearms is self-defense, not just recreation or hunting. And people buy semi-automatic weapons. I mean, uh, 10 years ago, they made up about 20% of all uh, firearms in the U.S. Now we're well above that. Half of all rifles manufactured in the U.S. now are, are versions of, uh, you know, what they call modern sporting rifles. You know, variants of the right. AR-15 and similar military-looking semi-automatic rifles. So these are mainstream weapons. People obviously have demand for them. So to announce that he's going to ban semi-automatics is to announce that he's going to ban what has become the predominant preferred action in firearms in the United States. And that's a big goal to lay out. No, I mean, I agree. Uh, you know, when you look at it and yes, half the rifles are, you know, black rifles or sporting rifles these days, but I mean, it's, it, it, and, and to take away a whole class of, you know, concealable, reliable, uh, I mean, you don't see them saying, talking about, we got to remove all semi-autos from the military, just give them single shots. I mean, how's that working out for Russia? I see all those guys running around with Mosin Nagants. I mean, you know, how's that working out for them versus a modern military with semi-automatic or full automatic rifles? It, it, that's the thing. It just, he obviously doesn't know what he's talking about. This reminded me very much of the whole Tucker Carlson, Carolyn McCarthy, tell me what's a barrel shroud. Oh, the barrel shroud is the shoulder thing that goes up. You got politicians making rules and laws about things that they don't, they can't possibly understand them. I mean, is he talking about semi automatics or is he talking about automatics? I mean, what is he, does he even know the difference? Yeah. I mean, even let's assume that he, even if we say maybe he only meant what they call assault weapons, which are the modern sporting rifles, uh, you're still talking once again about half of all rifles manufactured and sold in the United States. So that's a bold goal to say that you're going to ban all semi-automatic rifles, all modern sporting rifles, because people obviously want to buy those. Um, there was a court decision last year in a case challenging California's very restrictive gun laws, in which the judge pointed out that uh, you know, he actually compared the AR-15 to a Swiss Army knife. I mean, how useful it is and how in demand it is. Um, that case hasn't been decided yet, but it's going to be decided in light of the Bruin case that came down this year which emphasizes right. that you have to assume 
the constitutionality of uh, rights as they're exercised, unless there's other you know factors in the way. And when people are particular designs of them, of course there's social redeeming characteristics, or at least there are as perceived by the public that the president supposedly serves. Uh, you know, and this <clears throat> this again shows the. Uh, I think political disdain. I mean, Biden again saying the quiet part out loud, uh, the the absolute disdain for anybody. The the fact that he's like it's sick, and I don't I don't I'm not, look. I'm not trying to. I'm trying to look get into the mindset here, right? Because when he's like it's sick, it's sick that you want to buy a semi automatic rifle or a semi automatic firearm. And I'm trying to put myself in his. Why? Why is it sick? Because I find the enjoyment because it's a lot easier for my kids to go shooting with me when we don't have to reload every shot, when we can have a whole stack of magazines that we spent the night before reloading and getting ready to go shoot, or that I can protect myself from multiple attackers in a home invasion situation. Or, I mean, you know, why is it sick? That, that's, I think, really. That was the part that shocked me more than anything else was the his his choice of language because it just shows that the people who are on the <clears throat> the pro gun control side they can't possibly fathom why we would want a firearm and so yeah, and, to and them, this, it's a sickness. This is a government official who is surrounded by armed security at all times. I mean, he has the Secret Service when he was in the Senate. I mean, they had Capitol Police and, and other armed uh, armed you know, personnel defending uh, you know the politicians. So he must at least understand that armed defense plays a role in life. There's a value to it. Um, and so what he's what he's implicitly saying is that it's good for him and his and his cronies, but it's no good for the rest of us. And that's ridiculous. And even giving him, like I said, I, you know, I gave him a little bit of slack and I said, okay, maybe what he really meant was modern sporting rifles, so-called assault weapons. Except that a few months ago, he was criticizing 9mm, saying they'll blow your lungs out. Um, 9mm, of course, is the preferred right. most popular handgun round. I mean, you, you find that in those semi-automatic pistols that are being uh, derided, but it would make up a huge percentage of sales of firearms in the United States as people seek them out for self-defense because most of us are not surrounded by Secret Service personnel. So, yeah, he's removed from reality. He doesn't understand where the gun culture is now. He doesn't understand necessarily the terminology, what he's referring to. But even if he does, he obviously looks down on the idea that the public should be armed in, and protected by privately owned armed, arms in the same way that he and his buddies are. Right. Well, and, and that's, look, that's nothing new. I mean, Rosie O'Donnell, Michael Bloomberg, we could name a dozen people who all say the same things. And yet every one of them is surrounded by a cadre of guys with machine pistols under their vests. You know what I mean? So it's like it, it, it's not surprising to see those kind of uh, to see those kind of things. But it is frustrating, especially for those of us that live in rural areas or live in the inner urban city areas where it's very dangerous. And all they end up doing really is harming. Here's the thing that kills me. They end up harming the people who could least afford the, the the problems. You know, we've talked about how inner city people in poor and urban and poverty stricken areas are the ones that are most disproportionately hurt by a lot of the rules that these people are putting out there. I mean, they're supposed to be the champions of the, of the you know, the Democrats and stuff, supposed to be the champions of the poor. And yet all these roadblocks that they put in there uh, cause these people to be even less safe and embolden the criminals. Well, absolutely. One of the most empowering things, and, and you know, let, let's grant that obviously cities should be well, you know, well policed and they should be safe to live in and you shouldn't necessarily have to fear for your safety. But the reality is in many places you do. And the great equalizer, if you're a bodega owner or you're, a, you know, you're a woman walking down the street in a lot of these places is to be able to carry a firearm and for potential criminals to know that a lot of people around them are able to defend themselves. That does, and, and it did historically over the last several decades, reduce the crime rate. It brought, you know, it, it was a warning to criminals to know that it was possible and legal for people to do this, to arm themselves. And it was insurance for your business people and your people and your residents of these neighborhoods to know that they could defend themselves legally. So when you decry that at the same time as a politician that you are surrounded by armed self-defense, um, you it's an elitist attitude. It's contempt for liberty. It's also contempt for reality. It's just unrealistic. 
Um, I want to get back. <clears throat> we're coming up on the break here, but when we come back, I want to get back into the article specifically because you break down several interesting arguments. And one that I want to touch on for sure is the uh, focus of the Bruin decision uh, and in Heller, Heller also, but I think more so it really came to light more in the Bruin decision is of the, you know, the originalist intent of looking at any kind of law or restriction on a right, on a fundamental right uh, in the, in the, uh, in kind of the marker of the day and say, does this fall within that? And that's, that's become important because what we have is interpretation these days. And they seem to have forgot the intent, the originalist intent of what people were trying to see. And I think Brune is bringing some of that back. And I want to get your opinion on that here uh, when we come back. So don't go anywhere. Uh, JD to Chile is our guest. We're going to continue with him here in just a moment. It is Firearms Friday on the Michael Duke Show. Common Sense, Liberty based, free thinking radio. Don't forget to come out and join us on Facebook if you'd like at facebook.com slash Michael Duke Show, where you can hear the between the commercial break chat. And don't forget to go out to my website right now to get signed up for the five days of Christmas, courtesy of our friends at Satellite West, the Michael Duke Show, and your local radio station. Just go to MichaelDukeShow.com for that. We're going to be giving away bivy sticks. Back with more and JD to Chili right after this. Your mental suppository. The Michael Duke Show. I was going to make a joke about too chilly being too chilly here in Alaska, but you probably heard that a million times before. So it's a few, a few, a few, a few times. Like if I hear one more, like Duke, put up your Dukes, Duke of Earl, Dukes of Hazard. If I hear one more joke about that, one more, I tell you. Uh, so what else you've been doing? I mean, we're in the break, so we want to kind of shift gears a little bit, not repeat, but what, what have you been doing? You've been, you've been writing some good stuff here lately. What, uh, what's your, what's your primary focus? Or are you kind of in, I mean, I don't know how, a uh, I don't know how a journalist, uh, uh, or an editor's life works, but are you in kind of wind down mode here? Cause it doesn't seem like it. You've written like five articles in the last week or something that have been posted. So yeah, I mean, are you, I, I are actually, you, uh, it, well, I mean, the, one of our senators from the state today, Kristen Cinema, just uh, just uh, dropped out of the Democratic Party, so they wanted me to jump on that. I've written three days in a row, three thousand words in the last three days. I just can't, so, so I'll write that one up for Monday. But obviously, that, yeah. I mean, there's so much happening. Oh, there is. It is. You know, I was thinking about this the other day. I have been doing uh, this radio program for twenty twenty three years, twenty four years almost. And I just think about how things have changed in that time frame, just in the last 24 years. I mean, the Internet was here, but it was kind of, you know, it wasn't really up to speed yet. It was still in its first five years or so of infancy, you know, coming out of the mid 90s and stuff. And we look at today and things are just happening at such a rapid pace all around us all the time and we got to know it and we got to have our little computers in our hands all the time to know where we're going and what's going on and get the ding on anything that <laughs> i mean i think sometimes i yearn for the simplicity of uh you know picking up the phone at, at home and just putting it off the hook so i don't get bothered while i watch my scheduled tv at seven o'clock because i can't miss it with commercial breaks and all i mean there's pros and cons but boy it is just such a crazy time it, it is. I mean, I think the I think kind of trying to drink from that fire hose of information is is something we weren't designed for, and it does make us a little nuts. So I, I try to turn my my uh, phone off at least at night and just just get have some uninterrupted evenings. Yeah, my wife made me do that because it was like you know the second I get my phone, she goes, "You program that damn thing to go silent." And uh, and yeah, so I mean you know when my phone hits eight o'clock or whatever or seven o'clock at night, it just goes. <laughs> and goes dead and it doesn't matter you know she can get through the kids can get through everything else is absolutely silent and it it helps i mean it, it does help we got <clears throat> we got to remember the important stuff uh and i gotta say i'm really grateful to reason for providing a counterpoint they really has reason has been a, a, a an oasis of sanity in kind of an insane world i don't always agree with everybody that writes there i mean that's that's find me a place i guess unless you're in the extreme right or extreme left and that's all you do is is in the echo chamber 
But I got to tell you, that makes me think about all the different things. And uh, and then we occasionally get the breaks from uh, Andrew Heaton or uh, uh, the I can't remember the bearded guy's name that does the uh, unintended consequences videos. But I mean, you, you, then you put something funny up there. And I just I really appreciate reason for everything that you guys do over there. And, uh, and I want to thank you for that. Um, well, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, all right. We, so we disagree what, among ourselves also. I mean, I had to break up a Twitter yeah. fight between two of the staffers once. So, <laughs> well, I mean, look, let's face it. Come on, JD. There is nothing more contentious than two libertarians in a room together talking amongst themselves. That right. That's true. I mean, mm -hmm. you are not libertarian enough for me, JD, or I'm not libertarian enough for you or what <laughs> I mean, if I have, you know, we complain, I complain here in this state about the Republican Party circling the wagons, pointing all the guns inwards and pulling the trigger, right? They do that all the time here in the state of Alaska, but there is nothing worse than a group of, of libertarians getting together, trying to out libertarian each other, you know, Hayek, Mises, no, the thing, non-aggression, pro show, pro life. I mean, it's just like, yeah, it could get fun, but at least we can have, I think, a, a viable and easy discussion and agree to disagree, which I think is something that we've lost in this day and age. We we can't agree to disagree, right? Yeah, we, there seems to be a natural inclination to look for those points of contention. So instead of the 80 percent of stuff we might agree with somebody on, we're like, what do you mean? And, there's, and then we focus on that 20 percent where we disagree. And I don't know, maybe there's a survival characteristic to it. You're looking for that danger that's going to be posed out in the wild. We don't live in the wild anymore. They put us at each other's throats. Yeah, no, it is. It's horrific. And of course, the, the the biggest problem is, is that if you disagree, it doesn't make you wrong. It makes you evil. I mean, that's the thing. It makes you evil, right? So, all right, well, let's jump back into it. Here we go. The Michael Duke Show, Common Sense, Liberty-based, free thinking radio. <laughs> Okay, we're continuing now with J.D. Chili, who is a editor, contributing editor over at Reason Magazine. And he has been a busy little beaver the last few days, man. I mean, one, two, three, four, five, just in the last like week. He's, are you panting? I mean, it's, it's gotta be, it's, it's gotta be exhausting sometimes. It is. It is. I mean, you start writing a thousand words and you got another thousand words to deliver and uh, you, you lose track of what you're doing. <laughs> exactly. Well, let's get back to this article uh, about the president and his ban on semi-autos, because I think it highlights a couple points that I'm really interested in uh, talking about. Uh, first and foremost, uh, you know, this uh, one of the things that seems to have come out of Brune and maybe maybe I'm wrong and maybe you can correct me on this. But my, my perception is, is that Brune has really highlighted kind of the originalist intent doctrine of uh, of uh, any law that's written against not just the Second Amendment, but any fundamental Bill of Right rights. Right. I mean, it it looks at what the original intent was and the historical usage of it. And it has now kind of made that the bar uh, instead of this interpretive dance that many judges did. Well, I just I, I'm going to interpret it the way that I want. The Supreme Court said, no, you've got to look at the, what the founders said, what their intent was and what the historical usage has been. And that's flummoxing a lot of people. It absolutely is. I mean, if we look at it in broad terms, what the Heller case a decade ago did was to establish that, yeah, absolutely. The Second Amendment does protect an individual right, not some kind of a vague collective thing. And then what Brune did is kind of focus and said, and that individual right should be treated like any other constitutionally protected right, which means that the text applies to the practice of that right, that the practice is presumptively constitutional unless you could come up with a reason why it not. And so that should be treated the way speech is, the way a protection of our private documents is, the way any other constitutionally protected right is. Is that presumptively constitutional unless the state could demonstrate otherwise? Now, that's what Brun says. That we already know that some uh, judges haven't got the message. There was a case out of Oregon where uh, the new uh, magazine ban, 10 Round Magazine's right. ban was challenged. State judge went with Brun and said, yeah, yeah, this Federal judge went with the old dance, clearly didn't get the memo. So there's going to be some time before this settles in and before the Supreme Court, assuming that it maintains its will, 
um, kind of slaps down the rebellion on the ranks and says, no, you really have to take this seriously. Otherwise, we'll just keep on overruling you from on high. But overruling takes time. It's got to work its way through the courts. But yeah, what Bruin did is say that, th that Second Amendment rights are individual rights and they're protected the same way as other individual rights by the same standards. And, and I think, I mean, I think that's a blessing. I think that's really good, not just for Second Amendment rights, but for all rights, because, you know, again, this interpretive thing that seems to happen all the time is uh, is very frustrating to anybody who's actually read the Federalist, the Anti-Federalist Papers, the writings, the anybody who's done any reading on the formation of the country and the writing of the Constitution looks at these judges and goes, where did you go to school? Because that's not what they said when they said it. And and I think that that's encouraging. But you have seen this two step that they're I mean, New York and New Jersey right now are are doing it, you know, crazily. Anytime Bruin strikes something down, they change the few words and the language a little bit and they shuffle over here and then that gets struck down. And I mean, how long do you think this two step is going to go? Well, New York seems to be pretty explicit that they're just going to keep on doing this with the idea that they want to tire out federal judges. Um, they're going to make it as hard as possible for gun owners to exercise their rights, and they don't particularly care, New York legislators and New York enforcers, whether the courts consider it constitutional. They'll just keep on doing it. Um, I, so I guess it really matter. It depends on is there going to be any teeth in enforcement? Will the courts at some point uh, penalize New York for doing this? Because unless there's some kind of teeth in there, unless there's a penalty, so long as New York has the will to basically mess with people, um, it'll keep on doing so. And that's going to be the test for the courts. I, I agree. And of course, other states, New Jersey is taking a similar tack. Uh, California avoided some of that, but I think that they're still going to push back. Hawaii looked like they were going to avoid it, and then they embraced it anyway. I mean, it's, it's, it's frustrating to watch. Um, especially when we feel like it's such a victory. But I think you and I talked about this last time that we were uh, that we were together. Brune is going to have long lasting repercussions. And in fact, I think I, I personally think unless something fundamentally changes here in the next five years, I think historians will look back at Brune, especially gun culture historians will look back at Brune and say that was the tipping point to changing and to taking some of those things back because it, it affects so many, that decision affects so many different areas of current gun law. Yeah, I don't think people realize how dangerous, even if they weren't believers in self-defense rights, how dangerous the old standard was. The idea that, okay, there are individual rights, but they're not all subject, subject to the same level of protection and incursions against them aren't subject to the same levels of scrutiny. I mean, once you allow that for any set of rights, there's no particular reason it can't creep or, uh, creep across the board. And at a time when free speech rights are under assault, that's a particular danger with specific application to a core liberty that we've always enjoyed in the United States. So I think those who are trying to erode uh, self-defense rights were also eroding protections for other rights at the same time. And whether or not they appreciated that, that's what they were doing. So Brune along the long term is going to protect our rights to own firearms and defend ourselves, but should also help to protect our other individual rights as uh, covered by the Constitution. I, you know, I agree. And I think, again, what we're going to see here is uh, the, the other problem that the president's going to have on a semi-auto ban and everything else is we put four million new people in the gun culture last year alone. Four million brand new. And the demographic breakdown, as looked at by the NSSF and other organizations, is these are all not, you know, Michael Dukes, redneck, scratching their belly, beer drinking, Bible swilling, you know, whatever, uh, a Republican uh, Bible thumpers. These are minorities, women, Democrats. I mean, these are people who were, sh we, we heard all kinds of stories during the pandemic about people who were shocked, shocked, I tell you, that it wasn't as easy to get a gun as it was to get a library book, you know? And yeah. so we, we put 4 million new people in there last year. This year, the Knicks checks are, are, they're set to crush last year's Knicks checks numbers. So I don't know what the numbers will be this year, but I'm guaranteeing you it will be at least another 4 million. And so you're talking about tens of millions of new gun owners who are not going, and more than likely, probably the vast majority of them probably bought semi-automatics. And you're you're going to have a hard time convincing those people that it's a good idea because, hey, we're good guys. We're on your team. That's exactly it. I mean, a lot of the new gun owners, probably the bulk of them, are core demographic Democratic Party, at least what the Democratic Party considers to be the core demo demographic. Women, African-Americans, other minorities, also urban. 
And they are, by all, I mean, they were rushing out for self-defense purposes. When they were interviewed, that's what they were doing. So what they're, pur what they're purchasing are going to be semi-automatic pistols, um, AR-15s and similar right and similar weapons, and of course some shotguns and such in there too. But this, they're it, talking exactly about the things that uh, President Biden wants to ban. They're going to be primarily semi-automatic firearms, and if he's going to go after those, he's going to be heavily hitting people who are converts to gun culture, gun culture 2.0, and who come from the demographic support that's assumed for the Democrat. No. We lost you there for a second there at the end. Sorry. But uh, it's okay. Gun culture 2.0. I mean, he's going after his core demographic, essentially, is what yes. you're saying. Yeah. And, and that's, again, 100%. That is problematic. And I would love to see, if I can direct you here, JD, I'd love to see an article about gun culture 2.0 and how they are his new target. I mean, I would like to see a highlight of that because that's exactly what he's doing. He's going to be going after four to eight million brand new gun owners in the last two years. How do they feel about that? How does that help the Democratic Party? Uh, and I don't think it does. We're down to the last uh, minute and a half here or so. Uh, so I want to get uh, I want to get what what else? You, 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 like I said, you wrote a lot this last week. So give a highlight of some of the other articles and, and what do you got coming up next week? Well, school choice went up today. Uh, there's reports that school choice works just fine in rural areas, no Ooh. matter what the critics say. I mean, yeah. if you create demand, supply will meet it, especially as people innovate, develop things like micro schools and uh, better ways of doing homeschooling, which serve rural populations extremely well. Uh, Senator Sinema quit the Democratic Party today. She's a senator from my state of Arizona. That's going to have an impact on the balance of power in the Senate. And there's a report from Europe on declining democracy around the world. That's a big deal. We all kind of see that. The world's being a little less free. So I'll be writing that up next week. Yeah, no, absolutely. The school choice issue is a hot button for me. I have five children. Uh, uh, four of them are grown. One of them is still in school, but we homeschooled them all since the very beginning. Uh, it's been rewarding and challenging, but I would not change a single solitary thing. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, but this idea now of the micro schools, the learning pods, the backpack funding, like Corey DeAngelis has been talking about. Uh, maybe we should have you back on. I just seem to always have you on on gun days. I don't know why, but uh, maybe we should have you back on here sometime to uh, to talk about that because that's going to be a big deal here in the state of Alaska because that's the big push from our folks is to keep funding education and give them more money even though it's failing. Um, so maybe that's a good choice. Uh, JD to Chile, Reason uh, Magazine. I'm sorry. All right, we're losing here, JD. But uh, I just want to wish you a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, my friend. Thank you for coming on board. We'll talk to you again here soon, all right? Merry Christmas and take care. Merry Christmas to you as well. Thanks for coming in. Folks, we're out of time. The Michael Duke Show, Common Sense Radio. Oh. All right. Yes, do it, says Terry. We need to hear more about uh, the schools. Yes, yes, we do. Yes, yes, we do. Um, back in the lower 48, I would routinely see suburban minivans, dads going in with kids in tow, polo shirts and golf clubs, golf shorts rather, buying ARs, 50 cals. It was kind of scary to think about because you could tell just by looking at these dudes if the uh, stuff hit the fan, you wouldn't want to be within a two-mile radius. Well, but how else are they going to learn, Richard? I mean, how how else are they going to learn, right? they got to start somewhere. And, yeah, maybe they've got a Rambo complex or something, but they'll learn. I think most of them will learn. It takes a little bit of time, but most of them will learn. Um, it is kind of scary to think about. Um, all right, my friends, uh, what else we got going on here? What are you guys, you guys have been talking, have we, have I just, is it just been me and JD talking amongst ourselves? Cause you guys are talking about other things here. What do we say? Um, don't we love technology says Terry? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of crazy. Uh, but JD's right. I don't think we're built to take, uh, to take in the amount of information that we seem to be attempting to take in every day. I, I don't think that we're quite I, again, I think it it uh, it, it kind of makes us woggedy sometimes. This twenty four hour news cycle. I mean, I 
am so grateful that I broke my addiction to cable news. I mean, I had a, I had a pretty significant addiction to cable news. I would do stuff. I work all day. I do stuff for the show. I do the show. I'd come home and I'd turn on cable news and watch it for a while. Then on the weekend, I'd turn on cable news and it was just this constant overload of, uh, you know, and again, most stuff I have no way of, I, I got no, you know, no way of knowing. Is that another earthquake? We've had some shakers here the last couple of days. It's like, I just filled up. Maybe it's just my chair. I don't know. Uh, overconfident good old boy, says Daniel. Are, whoops, wrong one. Uh, says Daniel, are the worst. <laughs> You're not wrong. You're not wrong. That's why we have gun Q&A usually on Firearms Friday, to get around the overconfident good old boys, right? Uh, I haven't watched that Kibby on Liberty conversation, um, Brian. I saw it on the in the uh, Common Sense Core. Brian's a member of the Common Sense Core, and we get a lot of great links to different things in there. And I have I saw it, but I have not watched it yet. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. You see this gray hair? It's it's it is what it is. Um, it's uh, it's pretty crazy. But that does look like a good conversation, Kibby on Liberty. And I don't remember the gal's name. You can put the post the gal's name here in the chat room if you want, Brian. Uh, that he was talking about, but it was all about school choice. And it looked like a very interesting conversation. I, I want to hear more about that. Um, until this administration is gone, not much will get done. Need to get rid of the Democrats, DAs, and judges. Until then, we'll never win 2A cases. I think we are winning some of the 2A cases. And I mean, I don't know who we replace Biden with. I mean, Trump was really no better on guns than, uh, than uh, anybody else. Uh, I mean, he was all OK with eliminating due process and taking the guns and, you know, the bump stock ban and all the other stuff that he was a part of. I mean, he's he is not a gun friendly president. I don't care what the NRA or anybody else says. Look at his, you know, stop looking at the words that are coming out of his mouth and look at what he's actually done. And it's not good. So who do we put in there? Maybe DeSantis or somebody else? I, I don't know. Sandy said she was addicted to cable news as well. Don't watch it anymore. Much happier without it. A freaking men. Hannah Frankman was the interview that, uh, so if you want to find out this Kibbe on Liberty conversation, just go to Kibbe on Liberty and look for the Hannah Frankman interview. Um, and, uh, you could do it. Uh, good stuff, man. It's Friday. I basically got one week left of political stuff because the last three days, uh, of uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of Christmas week is going to be all I don't know. We're just going to riff. We're not going to talk about any politics at all. We might talk about favorite recipes, movies, music. Oh, it's going to be so much fun. It's going to be so much fun. I'm looking forward to it. It seems like sometimes those are shows are a lot more work, but they're so much more enjoyable in the long run. And, uh, <clears throat> and that comment was directed to Terry uh, more than you. Uh, it's okay. I didn't take it that way. Recipes. Sandy wants the recipes. I saw that Bill, uh, actually made Bill Brock. Bill, you still in here somewhere? Uh, Bill actually made my grandma's pumpkin pie recipe. I was scrolling through Facebook and, and, a, and the, and a picture went by and I was like, that looks like grandma. Cause it's, it has a kind of a distinctive look. The pie, you could tell the pie at a glance. And, and I, it went by and I was like, what? And I scrolled backwards and I'm like, that's grandma. And then I'm like, oh, it's Bill, who had been asking for my grandma's pumpkin pie recipe. <laughs> How was it, Bill? Was it good? Oh, man, I bet it was. I bet it was. So tasty. So tasty. Uh, you got to get a big pie plate for that stuff. All right, folks, time to jump back into it. Here we go. The Michael Duke Show. Common Sense, Liberty Base, Free Thinker Radio. Jumping in with Willie. Let's do it. Okay. <clears throat> well, we're ready. We're ready to, uh, we're ready to, we're ready for the weekend. I'm ready for the vacation already. I still got like a week and I'm just like, I'm ready. Don't tell anybody <clears throat> just between you and me. Uh, all right. Uh, Willie waffle, waffle comes in for the weekend movie review. 
uh and uh he's he's feeling our pain here with all the snow uh and uh and but still he's glad he's where he's at hey what's going on there sir what's happening I try to live my life like every day is vacation, but work keeps getting in the way. Yeah, that don't work, man. Yeah. I mean, I just, you know, if I didn't have to eat and sleep in a place where it's warm, I would really not do that work thing. Yeah, sleep. no, I, I was meant to be an eccentric billionaire. It is clear to me True. that is my path. That is what I have to accomplish. True. And then I saw a stat the other day on one of my radio journals was talking about earnings on things like Spotify. And I realized that even Kanye West as whack and as weird and as, you know, $30,000 a day in royalties from Spotify. Dear, dear God. $30,000 a day. And I'm like, I mean, I'm not a crazy. Why, why can't I get something like that? You know, seriously. I mean, I, I would say crazy things, but it would usually go much worse for me. I know exactly. You'd be, woof, you'd be done. All right. Well, let's, uh, <laughs> let's hit the headlines here. And uh, I guess we'll start off with the Christmas stuff. The top of the pops. This is a Christmas special that even I, the knuckle dragging troglodyte have heard of. Of course, I know all about the top of the pops, but it is now a thing of the past, right? I mean, what's going on? Well, yeah, so years ago, they ended the show Top of the Pops, but they always kept the Christmas special going. And, you know, anybody who, who's, uh, you know, an Anglophile or, or you're somebody who remembers the movie Love Actually and did how Billy Dye's character was trying to get the number one song so he could sing it on Top of the Pops at their big Christmas special. Well, that's what it's all about. And they've been doing that for like 60 years. And, you know, they've had Paul McCartney and Elton John. And it is it is a Christmas tradition in every sense of the word if you live in britain you watch the queen's speech and you watch the top of the pops christmas special well those bean counters have destroyed yet another tradition we are not going to have a top of the pops christmas special anymore humbug my, my friend humbug this is what happened when you have government run broadcasting that's all i'm saying there you go there you go <laughs> But, you know, I just, I mean, this, I love traditions like this. I mean, you know, things that tie generations together, we don't have a lot of those anymore. You know, there are very few things that all of us watch or all of us enjoy together. And, and another one is now gone. All right. Well, it's, and because it, it costs too much, right? I mean, apparently yeah. they, couldn't, they couldn't find the corporate <laughs> underwriting. They couldn't find advertising. Again, this is what happens when government gets involved. I'm just, I'm just saying. Yeah. Just you saying. know, dude, you know, PBS, which is, I, I'm sorry, I, I, is the biggest sham of public broadcasting ever with all the underwriters and all the, all the money they get. I, you know, I, I'm with you. Why couldn't it be? And I know this would make people feel bad. The Amazon top of the pops. Oh, sure. Or, you know, something like Mini that. Cooper, something. I mean, they would be, yeah. you, know, you know, uniquely British. Anyway. Cadbury. It's Cadbury it's, top of the pops. It's stupid. <laughs> Vegemite. Uh, all right. Uh, that's Australia, <laughs> not England. But um, all right. Let's let's uh, let's see. Uh, my wife got me started watching Wednesday on Netflix. Uh, she watched the first three episodes and was like, I think he's going to want to watch this. So she got me into it. And my gosh, it's actually really good. I've really enjoyed it. Um, and it is doing very well. Oh, it's doing fantastically well. Let me tell you how well it's doing. I was watching TV tonight, and Netflix was running commercials for it. They know they've got something big. They know they've got you know their next great series. And, and the numbers prove it. It has become the third series on netflix to pass a billion hours of viewing within its first four weeks w what company does that put it in oh squid games and stranger things four wow. okay wow yeah it's huge and and i never thought this would happen there are some calculations that say it might surpass stranger things four well, it did in its first week, right? I mean, in its first well, week. Well, yeah, it, it did in its first week, yeah. But, I mean, but overall, yeah, in overall views, it might. And i got to be honest, it's it's really enjoyable. I mean, it's really, uh, it's a fun romp. Um, and uh, I'm enjoying it. I'm only about halfway through it. So thank you, Amazon, for dropping them all at once so that I could watch it at my leisure. Uh, I don't have to wait around, but uh, I'm going to finish it this weekend. But that should be, that, I, that's good news. You know what? That just encourages more good programming, right? No more, right. you know, rings of power, wheel of time. Oh, my God. I'm so mad about that still. Never mind. I, I, I don't even want to talk about it. But, yeah, I mean, let's get some good programming. 
Yeah, and I think that you know it, it still shows that Netflix is the leader when it comes to the quality of programming. Uh, you know, Amazon is starting to catch up numbers wise. Disney is catching up numbers wise, but you know, it really is Netflix that can drop something that is culturally important. I mean, you know, yeah, we had HBO Max with the with the House of Dragons, but you know, that was already built in. You know, Amazon had, like you said, the Lord of the Rings, but that was already built in. This is something, yeah, it's a takeoff on a familiar product, but a product that was familiar to a whole other generation. Right. And and directed, or not directed, but produced by Tim Burton, who is very, very famous, again, for another generation. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and I'll be honest, House of the Dragon, um, I got to the halfway point where things kind of change in the show. I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but can things kind of change. I haven't picked it back up, man. It just did not grab yeah. me by the throat. You know, it just did not grab me. And I'm just like, well, I might finish it. Yeah, I might not. I, I, I So, yeah, it, it's it's uh, it's good news. Good news for Wednesday fans. All right. Um, I had to look this up or not look it up, but I had to wait and read this through several times when you sent me the little blurb on this one. Because I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, Swifties are suing. Who the hell are Swifties? What are Swifties? Is it an underwear company? What I mean, what is it? You know, and then, oh. I, then I figured out it's. Taylor Swift fans. The fandom is called Swifties. Yes, they they call themselves Swifties, and uh, and ooh, they're angry. Oh, they're riled up. Oh. They are. They are. They have gotten themselves a lawyer, and they are suing Ticketmaster for fraud and intentional misrepresentation they and this is all over ticketmaster's meltdown that occurred when uh when the taylor swift tickets went on sale a few weeks ago and they are claiming ticketmaster quote unquote this is my favorite part quote unquote intentionally misled pre-sale ticket buyers when it could not satisfy ticket demand well, dude, the, the the stadiums only fit so many people, man. Right, there's only so many <laughs> tickets, and when you've got 40 million people hitting the servers, you don't have a server on the planet that's big enough to handle that kind of traffic. No, you don't. But I'll tell you, where they're really, really I think, going to get them is, is some of the Ticketmaster practices. Yeah, the idea that they may kind of encourage scalpers to get tickets because when they resell them, Ticketmaster gets a piece. Yeah. So they're essentially selling the tickets two and three times. Uh, you know, now we've got, oh, we've got the politicians involved because maybe they want to get themselves on TV. So now the Tennessee Attorney General is investigating. The U.S. Senate is investigating. Taylor Swift is about to make a lot of appearances in front of uh, politicians wearing suits and ties, man. Well, I got to tell you, Ticketmaster, I have a friend who's a promoter and does concerts and stuff like that. And the things that Ticketmaster does, I'm not feeling bad for Ticketmaster. Uh, no. Ticketmaster and Live Nation, they are two parts of the same company. They're like promoters and ticket sellers. And like you said, they're encouraging people to buy the tickets and they give the scalpers like that seems like the front of the line because they sell the tickets, get their first cut. And then the scalpers come back and take those tickets and resell them at two and three times and they get another cut. And it's it it's a really scuzzy thing. It really oh, yeah. is a scummy thing. And I hope they get stung. I, I quite honestly do. I've been stung by Ticketmaster a couple of times uh, when we were unable to do shows uh, out of state that we were going to do. And uh, I have no I have no, I feel no pain for this. I feel no pain. Oh, no. And, and I am secretly hoping that Elon Musk will buy Ticketmaster and expose all of their wrongdoings, just like he is at Twitter. <laughs> OK. <laughs> all right, man. Uh, all right. Uh, Avatar 2. It. Oh, God. It may be huge. OK. It might be really big. And 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 this is the part where I start going. Yeah, I might have been wrong when I said that Avatar 2 was going to be the biggest bust of. 2022 i i i may have miscalculated i agreed with you though because again yeah. i have no desire i mean i have no desire to see you know but again maybe i'm not your average movie goer anymore i used to be we used to go to the movies all the time but not, maybe i've fallen out of that demo because i'm like meh but a 150 million dollar opening weekend that's the projection right now, and uh, and what they're basing it on is, um, you know, that there's you know there's there's all sorts of uh, studies and polling done by theater groups and studios, and and there's a other uh, there's a predictor called unaided awareness of a movie, where you know basically this person who's talking, he says, hey, what movie do you want to see? And about forty percent of people from all demographics from all walks of life said Avatar two. 
that is insanely yeah. high. Yeah, that is massively high. And uh, and uh, they are they are just getting ready to start counting the money. James Cameron, you know, every time I count out James Cameron, the man proves he me comes wrong. <laughs> he really comes through. Every that time I'm out, he pulls me back in. All right, yeah, <laughs> and and I will say this: uh, a couple of friends of mine saw it um, out in L.A. Um, earlier this week, and they could not stop gushy about how awesome it is all right well, yeah. well we'll have to see okay we're down to uh <clears throat> dang we're down to four minutes uh oh, okay. so i guess we got to pick and choose here uh i want to talk about the whale and i want to talk about uh uh pinocchio uh so pick one other one and let's go from there okay you know i'll i'll go with uh you know i you know harry and megan we've given them enough publicity to heck with them yeah let's talk about emancipation this is will smith's big oscar contending movie where he can't get nominated for an oscar and it's it's showing on apple plus tv it's based on a true story he's an escaped slave uh who who uh, escapes uh, escapes in louisiana and ends up joining the union army and uh for those of you who are familiar with it there's a there's a an extremely infamous picture of of him or this character that was taken um showing the the brutality and the scars that he had from all the beatings and right. mistreatment that he had as a slave. Yep. And this is this guy's story. Nobody really knows how much of it's true. Let's, you know, a lot of a lot of things have been lost to history. Uh, but it's more of an action movie, I think, more than an acting movie. I think Smith's a little bit, a little bit hammy, a little bit over the top. Uh, I really like it more when it's it's the action scenes, it's the chase. You know, the 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 slave chasers uh, who are who are after him and all the ingenuity that that Will Smith's character has to pull out in order to survive. I would go three waffles for emancipation. Do you think it's Oscar worthy? No, I don't okay. think it's going to get there. I really don't. OK, uh, I want to talk about the whale. This is a big deal. Brendan Fraser, who's been in relative obscurity for years, who's a great actor. I think I really like him as an actor and as a person. It seems like in his personal life, he's a he's a very likable person. He plays in a new movie called The Whale. He's a 600 pound man trying to right his wrongs during the last week of his life. Give me yeah, the rundown. And it, it's really a character study. I mean, it is it is this guy, um, you know, who basically is is homebound. He he barely can move. Um, he he relies on on a caregiver that was uh, his his basically his boyfriend's sister. Uh, you know, he relies on a local church missionary who comes by. He relies on the pizza guy who just drops off the pizza on the porch every night. You know, and uh, and he tries to reach out to his young daughter, played by Sadie Sink from uh stranger things oh and he's he's desperately trying to get her set on the right path while he has his chance because he knows he's screwed up he knows he has screwed up just about everything in his life and now he wants to try to do a little something decent while he has his last breaths and he knows he's dying he knows it's a matter of time. Wow! Uh, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go three waffles. Fantastic performance from Brendan Fraser, and and you're right. He is a really nice guy. Um, I ended up uh, I ended up meeting him uh, years ago when he was promoting uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth. Right. And uh, and we had a nice little time. We hung out. We watched uh, the the end of the movie together and kind of chatted up uh, before he went and did his thing. And just a decent, kind hearted lovable guy you want to see him do well i hope he, he, there's a lot of talk about him getting an oscar nomination i think he, he's got a real big chance of winning uh if he does i mean i would love that i just love it and he even said he'd get back into shape for the mummy four or three or whatever it was yeah wanted, well no, no, and he, you know, he was going to be in the Batgirl movie that got that right. got canned by HBO Max. So, you know, he's getting a little bit of a comeback right now. Yeah, I hope he makes it. I really do. I really enjoy him. All right, finally, um, Guillermo, uh, Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. Now, uh, del Toro is he's great. He does the sci-fi yeah. and the dark fantasy, and it's it's dark and it's foreboding and it's brilliantly shot. It's beautiful cinematography. This is the retelling of Pinocchio. You got 60 seconds. Give it to me. It is the the non-Disney version, and you just hit it right on the head. It's a little bit darker, a little bit more dangerous, as and and really uh, it holds true to the original book a great deal more. So we see more about Geppetto's first kid and what happened and, and why he's so depressed, and, and we see all the, the interactions with Pinocchio and the adventure that he goes on, which is very similar to the, 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 the movie you've already seen. Uh, you know, I think that I love the stop motion. I think it looks cool. Um, I, I like the take on it. I like the tone of it. 
I'm going to be at like two and a half waffles. I think it drags a little bit at times, and uh, I lost a little bit of interest at times, but it really picks up, I think, in the last like half hour when they do a twist on that 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 island of naughty boys that I thought was really cool. All right, negative one to four waffles. Give it to me quickly. Two and a half waffles. Two and a half. All right, Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio uh, on Netflix. Uh, Willie, thanks, my friend. We got to go. Uh, folks, we're out of time. We'll see you on Monday. No idea who we're going to have on, but we'll have a fun time. Man, we are some chatty. We are some chatty chicks. I got to tell you, you and me, it's like old hands club. I'm like, okay, we got to cut some of this stuff out because I know it's going to be, oh, we'll, we'll be fine. It'll be fine. Don't worry about it. You know? And then we get ready to run a minute and a half over or something. Anyway, um, <laughs> I uh I can't wait to see Brendan Fraser. Uh I watched yeah. him on um Doom Patrol and the series was okay. But I mean I thought he did really well for the fact that he's acting basically in a metal mask and it's basically just voiceover with some physical, you know, physical comedy. Um but I really, you know, I missed him. I missed him from The Mummy. I missed him from some of those uh some of those action movies. I mean, he was the guy back in the day, you know, yep. when it came to action stuff. Well, yeah, and, you know, a couple movies didn't do very well. Um, he had some personal problems. He was harassed and um, kind of went within himself for a while just to get away from Hollywood and, and all of that pain and, and all those troubles that he had. I mean, you know, it, it was really difficult. I mean, you know, here was a guy that, you know, in many ways was on top of the of the world and eventually everybody falls. Yeah. And uh, na now he's, ha he's having his chance to kind of, you know, do these smaller roles to show people what an actor he was. Yeah. And, and is, and is. And uh, yeah, I'm sure he'd love to do Mummy 4 again. Uh, I don't know if that would ever be in the, uh, in the picture for him but you know there's going to be some other stuff out there yeah and uh you know i i think that you know he he now has a new career resurgence a renaissance and uh, we're going to enjoy some of the things he does over the next 10 years uh, i gotta tell you I, did you see the video clip of him at the i guess it was the golden globes um or was it the cans when he actually when they had the standing ovation for him the audience yeah uh, cans cans yeah. yeah i mean it was amazing i mean he just really got choked up and it's just you know you got that feeling like i mean i watched it and i'm i'm not hard-hearted but you know i watched it and even i was like wow a little misty in here what's going on i mean he was yeah. just, he was obviously moved by uh the appreciation of his uh of his cohorts and his compatriots there and uh and i think it just shows that again a decent honest guy yeah you know, i don't think i see tom cruise getting that kind of very emotional standing o uh, for so long, I, I, you know, it's just, I, I think, I, I think it was good. Let me just put it that way. Oh yeah, no, it's good. It's good. And, you know, we're going to, we're going to see a very interesting, uh, I think best ask, best actor race at the Oscars. I think you're going to see Brendan Fraser in there. There's talk that Tom Cruise is going to slide in there for, uh, for Top Gun. And I think, I think Top Gun's going to be uh, one of the movies that's up. Yeah. Yeah. We talked yeah. about that a little bit last week. What do we yep. got for, uh, what do we got for next week? Oh, God, next week it is Avatar 2. Now, it's not technically Avatar 2. It's Avatar The Way of the Water. Right. But it's it's Avatar 2, people. Okay? Right. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be uh, trying to avoid all the water for all the day and then sit there for three hours and 15 minutes and take it all in <laughs> next week. Oh, my God. And, and you know, and, and th that's always the death death now right you look at that runtime you're like three hours and 15 oh my god you know i was i was watching a movie over the weekend that we're going to talk about in a few weeks called babylon and it was a three hour runtime i'm like oh i don't know if i've got it in me but luckily that one's really good um i don't know about avatar but I, everything i've been hearing from from every aspect and from people that i trust and who have very similar tastes to mine is that uh, this is going to be a really good movie. You know, we I don't know, maybe because next Friday is going to be the last broadcast Friday for a year for me. And um, maybe we should do a double feature or something. Maybe we should do year review or something fun. I don't know. Let's, let's just think about it. Talk about it. Maybe we do a double segment or something that if, if you're up to it, I, you know, we, we will noodle it. We will, we yeah, will, we let's, will consider let's noodle, it. Yeah. Noodle that out. Maybe we do and just, I, I, I don't know. You you guide me on this. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, Willie Waffle. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it. Hey, anytime, man. I'll talk to you next week. Okay, folks. I really mean it. I'm leaving now. I got stuff to do. People to do things. I'm, bye. We'll see you Monday. Don't forget to go sign up for that brand, for the, your chance to win that bivvy stick, michaeldukeshow.com. 
Click on the five days of Christmas logo there and you could win it. A brand new bivy stick. We're giving away five, one day a week, one a day, starting next week on Thursday. Oh, it's, it's Friday. All right, my friends, we'll see you on Monday. Have a great day. We've shed our terrestrial radio skin, and now we are slimy lizard internet people. It's the Michael Duke Show.